of the early morning and the other is the kind of the busyness of the times that we're serving God whether it's early morning or late night but uh, uh, God is to be exalted in all that we do all that we say welcome here this morning we're just going to start morning breaks I Welcome here, everyone. We're at 35 Oliver. There's several people around, but we have some people online. Welcome here. We bless God together. We bless you, and we pray God would bless you as you attend, whether online or in person. Thank you very much. We have uh, one announcement. Uh, next Sunday after the service, at approximately 11.15, we plan to have a congregational meeting. Um, you're all of you welcome to be at the meeting. Um, the members will be considering the matter concerning whether to call uh, the pastoral candidate that uh, was here a couple of weeks ago. And the leadership would like to have as many people as possible attend that. Um, I think there are provisions for uh, attending online. Is that correct, Ted? Okay. 
So um, you can find out about that by call, calling somebody on leadership or calling the church office. Um, if you're at all interested in that sort of thing, if you need the details, uh, any sort of prior uh, information, please reach out to one of the leaders and uh, find out. Okay, so let's uh, begin in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless you. This is your day. We thank you for the, the sunshine. We thank you for the weather. Thank you for the rain that we had yesterday and uh, keeping the fires at bay. We think of those people who are suffering now because they're in dry areas and those people who are still dealing uh, in other places with floods and with other kinds of problems. We are people who desperately need you, oh God. And we acknowledge that, we praise you, that you are the one God who rules not only our lives but all of our circumstances. We depend upon you, oh Lord God. We thank you for all that you extend to us. We thank you for all the blessings. We honor you this day as our Father. Happy Father's Day. And help us as we sing together to bring joy to your heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. So as is normal, uh, well, you probably understand that because Jim is not here, uh, Jim's taking a well-deserved uh, break. It's not a holiday, though. He doesn't feel well and didn't feel it would good, be good for him to be around people at this particular time. So uh, remember him in your prayers, that God would bless him. Um, it's been an amazing uh, amount of time that Jim has been able to lead uh, us in worship. We have all blessed and have been blessed and benefited from that. We just pray that he would have uh, adequate time to rest as well. So, having said that, you're stuck with me, uh, which means you get to do a whole bunch of songs that you've never done before. I did have a couple. If you if you're patient, hang with me. Uh, there's a couple that you will have we will have done before. But these first few are ones that you don't hear very often because I don't get to lead very often. Anyway, I've been storing up things as we've been coming through this COVID crisis. I hear a song and I just think, oh, I want God's people to hear this song. So that, the next couple are kind of like that. You may not have heard them before, but they're, they're actually appropriate to Father's Day because it's the group that does these next couple of songs is a group called All Sons and Daughters. So they're songs not from fathers so much as to the father. This first one, I think, is kind of important in uh, light of the um, events that we've had the last couple of weeks, all of the sorrow and sadness, the the uh, crisis that has been felt in First Nations communities, it cannot be overstated that the impacts have thoroughly shaken communities to the core. There are many, many fathers who have been grieving the loss of their children and um, are still. There are aunts and uncles, there are cousins that are missing and... Um, there's a lot of pain out there. And this song kind of uh, starts with pain. <laughs> it starts with, uh, and, and, and it, it, as it goes through the song, it begins to share God's compassion on those who are hurting, those who are experiencing sorrow. So hopefully I'll be able to do it. <laughs> Sometimes when I talk about singing a song too much before I sing it, then I can't sing it because I'm too choked up with emotions. So pray for me. Anyway. Feels like an ocean Sorrow is under my skin Even the ocean eventually meets with the sand Sorrow on sorrow I'm waiting Heavy with Trusting the current carry me. You are my strength. You are my song. 
first service I mentioned to people that this is probably the first time that I've done this in rehearsal this morning as we were doing this next song um, I uh, couldn't help but think of times when I was in uh, a young person uh, eons ago back when dinosaurs roamed the earth um, we used to have dances and, and we dance usually in tep- separate time zones you know girl here, boy over here, and moving around roughly in, in time with the music. And then they would they'd have a slow dance, and the slow dance would be when the guys would think, I'm thirsty, I should go get a pop. Um, so as you get older, guys become more fond of slow dancing. Um, this song has a kind of a gentle pace to it. Um, And I couldn't help, as we were rehearsing, I couldn't help uh, thinking of it as uh, God's slow dance. Um, 
So a lot of times at dances and events, they'll have a father-daughter dance. So at this particular point, we all get to be God's daughters um, for the slow dance. You can kind of... It just kind of has an easy pace. was listening to a podcast out of Australia called uh, Life and Faith. It's a regular podcast that I listen to and uh, we're interviewing someone from, uh, well, he lives in the United States but he's of Japanese ethnicity and he was discussing a, a Japanese art form um, in which they, uh, they break, not necessarily deliberately, but it's broken uh, tea cups and they put them back together very carefully putting them back together and with all their imperfections that sort of thing they cover it over with gold and um, 
he was explaining in this in this process that there's a very strong Japanese commitment to the idea that only only brokenness can produce beauty that beauty whenever you find it comes out of brokenness and this particular person or this particular artist was likening that to theology that out of Christ's great brokenness comes our lives and out of our own brokenness comes the beauty that God does and so that that uh, last song speaks to that out of my imperfections uh, we try to get rid of our imperfections don't we we try to pretend that they're not there but they're the very stuff that God wants to use to work in our lives to bring beauty and he does that through the sacrifice of Jesus as this next song in case you were wondering your endurance of the first three songs has now produced a couple of songs that you will know we're going to do this song just before Ted comes how deep the father's love for us how vast beyond all his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is Thank you, worship team, for a great job, and uh, it's uh, Happy Father's Day for those who are, well, Happy Father's Day to everybody, that's going to be great. So, um, today is sort of a, a special kind of um, challenging message called Parenting, uh, from Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, and um, 
that's a huge challenge. Parenting is a huge challenge. Uh, I find it very even challenging to prepare the message today and, and what have you. But uh, anyhow, uh, we're going to get into it, and let's pray before we do that. Father, we thank you for your gracious love to us, and um, you know, uh, we're imperfect human beings. I already talked about that. We're fragile and uh, broken in many ways, and yet we have your love for us, your love in us, and uh, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, we thank you for that grace and that love and that power that's available to us, and I just pray that uh, you touch our hearts today as we, as we look to the message. And Father God, just pray for those who are in our midst who are uh, really struggling physically, uh, various sicknesses and other challenges, Lord, you know what they are, and uh, many of them, Lord, and we just ask for your special hand of grace and love to touch their lives even today. And Father God, uh, just bless the message as it goes out. Uh, it's always delivered imperfectly because, it's, because we're imperfect people. But Lord, the Holy Spirit, uh, we just thank you that the Holy Spirit can take that message and touch each person's um, place and heart and mind where it needs to be touched, to be built up and encouraged in you. And we pray that you would do that miracle again this morning. We ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Parenting. And um, again, uh, based on Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. And let's read it, uh, verses 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it might go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parenting is, uh, I think, one of the toughest challenges in life and maybe for some it is the toughest challenge the problem is of course we have no experience as a parent when we begin parenting right <laughs> and uh, you sort of make mistakes as you go along and sometimes we learn from our mistakes and sometimes we don't learn from our mistakes and uh, if our parents in our upbringing was a little bit dysfunctional within normal then we of course bring that into our own parenting situation the only way we know how to parent is by observing what we observed when we were brought up. So it's, it's a huge challenge for all of us, and it's not an easy thing to talk about, but hopefully with God's grace we'll have some um, insights and help this morning. In this passage, uh, Paul uh, first talks about how children should treat their parents in verses 1 to 3, and then how parents should treat their children in verse 4. Now, the first thing we notice is this. Uh, it is that God respects and gives respect and honor to children. In this letter, Paul speaks directly to children. Verses 1 to 3 are, are addressed directly to the children. And he doesn't talk to the parents about how they should teach their children to behave. No, no. He goes around the parents and talks directly to the children. And that's not normal, especially in that culture. In that culture, whether it was Jewish, Greek, or Roman, children were not included in any adult discussions. They were not valued and respected as unique human beings in that way. They were seen, but not heard. And sometimes they were not even seen, of course. They behaved or else. There was much cruelty in the way children were treated in that society. Not maybe in every family, but there was a lot. In the Roman world, unwanted babies were simply abandoned. Weak and deformed ones were often killed even. And even healthy children were regarded by many as simply a nuisance. But when Jesus came, he began to restore the dignity of children. People would bring their little ones to Jesus to, for him to pray for him, of course. And the disciples would say, oh, no, don't, don't bother the master. He's busy. Don't bring these snotty little kids around here. Just leave him alone. But Jesus said, no, 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 let them come. Let, let the little children come to me. The kingdom of God belongs to people such as this. Children are precious to God. And we've already talked about how Christianity elevated the value of women and wives. And it has done the same thing for children. God has always considered 
children to be precious and valuable human beings. The prophet Joel in the Old Testament, uh, hundreds of years before Jesus came, of course, predicted the day when Jesus would come and the Holy Spirit would eventually come upon and live in everyone, not just kings and priests and prophets. But notice the first category of people, the very first category of people who would be honored by the presence of God in them and through them. It was children. Look at this, Joel 2, 28. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. In the first category, your sons and daughters will prophesy. God is saying, even your children will be born again by the spirit of God and I will live in them and I will speak directly to them and I will speak through them. Now that's what it means to prophesy. It is receiving an inspired word from God and then passing it on to others. Even the word of God to adults will be spoken through children. They will have my spirit and they will prophesy. Amazing, shocking, unheard of. God speaking to adults through little children. I was reading a book uh, recently. Uh, a book that I read every so often. It's one of my favorite books. And um, there's a story that's told about a little girl. She was about five years old, maybe four or five years old, who was with her mother at a revival meeting uh, when a pastor was preacher was a visiting preacher was speaking. And at the end of the sermon, in, in those kind of meetings, quite often they'll invite anyone who doesn't know Jesus as a Lord and Savior to come forward to accept Jesus into their hearts. And at the end of the message, the pastor invited people to the front of the church to accept Christ as their Savior. And the five-year-old girl, you know, tugged on her mother's uh, dress and said, Mommy, I, I want to go forward to accept Jesus. And the mother replied, Oh, no, you're, you're, you're much too young to understand that right now. Maybe later sometime. A few moments later, she tugged on the dress again. Mommy, I really do want to go forward to accept Jesus. She said, No, no, just wait, dear. Some, some other time later when you're older. And then a couple moments later, the daughter tugged on her mother's address again and the mother looked down at her and she had tears in her eyes and the, and the, and the little girl said, Mommy, Jesus just saved me. And so Paul spends three verses directly talking to the children. Only one verse talking to the parents, verse 4. He was honoring the children as if they were responsible adults because they were precious to God and God can speak to anybody. So, in these three verses, Paul gives three reasons why children should respect and obey their parents. And first of all, they should do it because it is normal. It is normal. Children obey your parents for this is right. It's, it's just the right thing to do. It makes sense. Children obeying their parents has always been the normal thing to do in any culture, in any time period, in any religion, or even among atheists, it doesn't matter. Everyone has always believed that parents should be honored and obeyed by their children. Parents obviously know more than their small children. Children cannot look after themselves. They are totally dependent. Children are not born with the life skills to live. They must be taught. Parents teach them how to communicate, how to act, and hopefully how to love. When children are very young, they are motivated through, uh, well, for the most part, through words and consequences. It is the only language they understand, really, in terms of outward things. Don't touch that hot stove. Don't run out on the street. Don't drink that cleaning fluid. It will kill you. <laughs> For most cultures, the goal is to prepare them for adulthood. It is to prepare them to live responsibly and productively. Parents are to progressively give them more and more freedom as time goes on and more and more responsibility as time goes on and less and less laws over time so that they can learn to live responsibly and independently. And even the book of Genesis, the Bible, in the beginning, tells us that when children reach adulthood that they are to leave their parents and their parents influence and start their own family it is there that they no longer obey their parents as it were it's then that they honor their parents 
And it's even the same in the animal kingdom, right? I mean, <laughs> birds push their babies out of the nest so that they can learn how to fly. Bears teach their cubs how to fish so they can eat. Mother deers keep their eyes on their fawns. Obey your parents, children. It is just natural. It's common sense. It is right. The second reason children should obey their parents is this. It is commended. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and you may live long in the land, Ephesians 6, 2-3. to In the Old Testament, and in our society, laws are usually um, used, usually used in a negative way to motivate us. God most often says, if you break my laws, there will be consequences Fear of breaking the law is the primary motivation to obey the law. Uh, now, for example, if I'm going down the highway and uh, I'm going a little bit fast over the speed limit, which is quite common for me, anyhow, uh, and I see uh, a police, I have to look ahead, and sometimes I got a hawk eye. When I look ahead and I can see a police car on the side of the road, you know, ahead of me, what do I do? I immediately slow down. Why? Why do I do that? Because it's a loving thing to do? Because I think it's safer for people around me and for us? No! <laughs> I am afraid of getting a ticket for speeding. It is just raw fear. And the law motivates us the same way. When is the last time a policeman has stopped you for, uh, and, and said, I want to congratulate you for your excellent driving. Here's a gift voucher to Mr. Mike's, or McDonald's if you prefer. That will never happen. Our relationship to the law is primarily a fear relationship on both sides. When children are infants, they need lots of love, but they also need lots of laws that have uh, consequences attached to them for disobedience. Now notice how Paul, under God's inspiration, uses the law in a positive way to motivate children. He says, this is the first commandment with a promise. This is good for you. If you do this, things will really go well for you and, and you will live a long time. So, when children do obey the rules, they also need to receive praise, encouragement, and rewards. That's kind of the po positive use of the law and that's the way Paul used it <clears throat> when he was talking to the children. Now, there is uh, something we need, else we need to know about the, the, this commandment. It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? To honor parents. It's the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Now, we usually divide the Ten Commandments up between the first four and the last six. Now, why do we do that? Because the first four have to do with obeying God. No other gods before me. Don't bow down to graven images. Don't take my name in vain. Remember my Sabbath. And the last six have to do with our relationship with each other. Honor your parents. That's the first one, right? Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. But the Jews always said there were five commandments on each of the two tablets which Moses had and that would mean the fifth commandment to obey our parents would be on the same stone tablet as the commandments to obey God. Do you know why? It is because for the first two or three years of a child's life, parents are the only representation of God that they know. We give them life like God gives us life. We totally provide for their needs like God totally provides for our needs. We give them basic instructions uh, for to live as God gives us instructions. We love them like God loves us. To an infant, we represent God to them. Children, when you obey your parents in spirit, you are obeying God. And that is a wonderful blessing. It is the first commandment with promise. So children are to obey their parents because it's normal and it's commanded. And finally, the third reason children are to, bear, to obey their parents is this. It is supernatural. Children, obey your parents in the 
Lord. So at this point, Paul is uh, talking to older children who would have had a personal relationship with God. Maybe they would have been anywhere from 5 to 15 years of age. I don't know. Who knows? But they would be older because he is assuming that they are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, just like Joel prophesied, right? So they would have to be old enough to understand what it means to accept the Lord. So he says that they are to obey their parents in the Lord. But what does it exactly mean, uh, that phrase, in the Lord? Um, what does it mean? Well, in Ephesians 2, Paul tells us, uh, I mean, this phrase, in the Lord, is found about seven times in the book of Ephesians. And I think the first time it's found is in Ephesians 2. Let's take a look at it. Paul tells us that everyone in the church family is like a building block of the temple that God is joining together by his presence. In the Old Testament, the temple was, of course, where, where God lived. There's the presence of God. But now God lives in the bodies of believers. And because we each share in the life of God, we are united together by having the same supernatural spiritual life. So, to be in the Lord, as we look at Ephesians 2, 21 to 22, is to have the life of God in us that we share with each other. Well, this is what it says exactly in verses 21 to 22. Uh, in Him, in Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. There's that phrase. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. To be in the Lord, then, is to be immersed into the life of God, to be in His presence, and to have the life of God inside of us. It is to be one in spirit with God. And because all Christians are one with the life of God, we are joined together with the life of God as various blocks of the temple are interlocked as one to build the temple where God lives by His Spirit. Now, another place in Ephesians where Paul mentions uh, being in the Lord, it's just nine verses later from Ephesians 6, 1, where children are told to obey the parents in the Lord. Here it is. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the Lord, and in His mighty power, Ephesians 6, 10. This verse tells us that all Christians are in the Lord and in His mighty power, that happens when we're born again by the Spirit of God. But that doesn't mean we are all functioning, functioning, I would say, in the Lord. We might still be functioning in our own fleshly power. But we are told that we need to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. We can be weak in the Lord or we can be strong in the Lord. That's our choice. But we can we can live our lives primarily in our own strength as if God didn't live in us, as if he didn't, he does, but it, we can live it as if he didn't. Or we can live our lives by faith in dependence upon God's life and love that is in us. It is not our ability, it is our availability. When Paul said, uh, uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord, he is telling them to obey their parents with the powerful life and love of Christ within them. In other words, he is telling them to lovingly obey their parents from their hearts, the same way that all Christians should love each other. Jesus said these famous words in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15 5. But how can we remain in Christ so that his life and love will act be activated in us? It's there but if it takes faith to release it, right? Jesus tells us four verses later in John 15 verse 9. As the Father has loved me so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Jesus is saying something that is very hard for us to believe. He said that in the same way that God the Father loves him, God the Father loves Jesus, Jesus loves us in the same way. He is saying he loves us in the exact same way God loves him. 
And if we believe that God and Jesus love us as much as God loves Jesus, then we will remain in his love and his love will flow out of us. To remain in the Lord, we need to remain in his love for us. But how many, how many of us really believe that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. Think about it. Really? Really that much? I doubt any of us in this room really do to the full extent. But Jesus challenges us to try and believe it because we can only supernaturally love each other to the degree that we believe that God supernaturally loves us even in our imperfection, right? Right? If, if, if the love of God is conditional upon our obedience, then it's not the love of God. That's just the way it is. The true Christian life is a life of constant praise for the grace of God. We are not here to impress God. See how wonderful I am, Lord? We're here to be impressed by God. When our hearts are filled with grateful praise, that's when our lives are filled with with God's love and that's when we are transformed we do not transform ourselves it is God who transforms us so children who are functioning (laughs) or strong in the Lord are experiencing the life and love of Christ in them and through them and that is uh, that is with the supernatural love that children want it's with that supernatural love that the children want to please their parents when the love of Jesus is flowing out of them it's easy to love parents from their hearts but a contrast to the normal experience of most children finally let's take a look at the parents responsibility towards their children in verse 4 parents get one verse the children get three <laughs> Here it is, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, first of all, why does he say, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger? Why aren't the mothers included? <laughs> the first couple of verses talked about parents. Well, quite often in that culture, in that language, sometimes men and women are addressed as men. Today we might say, Mankind, And when we say mankind, we don't mean only men. We mean men and women. And when we, uh, the New Testament consistently addresses, for example, Christians as both, uh, both men and women as brothers. That's what it says in the original Greek, even though it also refers to the woman, obviously. That's just the way they spoke in that time and that culture. So today we would consistently say, consistently say, parents do not provoke your children to anger. It refers to both, of course. But what does it mean? to provoke our children to anger. Does it mean that we should never say no to our children if if it's going to make them angry? That happens sometimes, lots, right? (laughs) No. (laughs) Sometimes we need to say no in love for their benefit, even if it causes a negative reaction. Now, Jeff uh, Jeff Van Vonderen, where I started this sermon series on uh, on the family, he says that there are several Greek words for anger, and the word used here is perigismos, and it means, he says, seething hostility. It refers to an anger that is uh, forced to exist beneath the surface, or we'll call that suppressed anger. And we are not to provoke our children to this kind of anger. You now it would seem to me that children instinctively know when we are selfishly taking our frustration out on them. They know when we are controlling them and making them conform because we are physically stronger than them. We just want them to stop irritating us. Have you been there? They feel like they're being disrespected and abused. And they may conform outwardly, oh yes, but they will be harboring seething anger. We crush their spirits and lose their hearts. We have provoked them to seething anger. Children subconsciously know uh, when they are angry because they are being jerks (laughs) and when they are angry because we are being jerks. 
It is the latter case that causes seething anger and woundedness in their hearts. Paul seems to think that this is the major pitfall that parents can fall into. It is the only warning to parents that he mentions. It is when we stop loving our children and start forcibly controlling them for our own benefit. Or maybe we just start ignoring them because we can't be bothered with them. In his commentary on Ephesians, John Stott makes some suggestions uh, as to ways parents commonly provoke their children to anger. It's about a paragraph. I'm gonna, I mean, I've got it right there word for word. I'd just like to quote it if I could. I thought it was quite good. Parents can easily misuse their authority either by making irritating or unreasonable demands which make no allowances for the inexperience and immaturity of children or by harshness and cruelty at one extreme or by favoritism and overindulgence at the other indulgence at the other or by humiliating humiliating or suppressing them or by those two vindictive weapons sarcasm and ridicule unquote now my mother always meant well she was not a perfect parent nobody's a perfect parent and she did the best she could with the resources that she had but there were times when she would shame me in order to make me behave <laughs> and I can remember one time we had some <clears throat> visitors over to our house and I had them over for a meal and we went into, we had a dining room and, and everybody was seated around the dining dining room table and uh, for some reason she brought something up uh, something naughty I had done a few days earlier of course I did I didn't do bad really bad things I'm you know I never did that but um, I did something naughty and 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 uh, she brought it up and she went on and on and on about it and I felt so uh, ashamed and humiliated and I think probably uh, the visitors there were feeling kind of sorry for me and um, I, I, I resented it those times they left scars on my heart towards my mother they really did but you know what probably her parents had done the same thing to her and you know what I know I've done the same thing to my children in various ways. Now Jeff would uh, say that when we uh, do that kind of thing to our children, we're trying to get our self-esteem from having well-behaved children so people would think well of us. <laughs> Instead of getting our shame healed through the love of Jesus, we try to control our children through shame so we can feel better about ourselves. We probably reason that we're helping our children to be better people, but trying to control our children through shame is one way to provoke our children to anger. It is a selfish thing to do, not a loving thing to do. God does not discipline us through shame. Maybe we sometimes we think he does, but I don't see it in scripture. He heals our shame through his gracious love, and that's what causes us to love him in return. John Stott says this, quote, children are little people in their own right. As such, they are to be respected and on no account to be exploited, manipulated, or crushed. Every child must be allowed to be himself. And then Paul gives us the positive side of parenting. In Ephesians 6, verse 4, and we'll close with this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now that phrase, bring them up, is a little sterile. The Greek word actually means more to nourish and even to cherish. So the phrase means to nourish and cherish them as you discipline them and instruct them about the Lord's love. So here are two other translations that I think bring it out maybe a little bit better. Um, first from the Amplified. Fathers, do not irritate and provoke, provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to resentment. But rear them tenderly. There's that Greek word that comes out. Tenderly in the training and discipline and, and the counsel and admonition of the Lord. And I like the Living Bible. It says this. And now a word to you parents. <laughs> Don't you like that? Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself 
approves with suggestions and godly advice. John Calvin, okay, we're in a Reformed church here. John Calvin, Reformed man, translated it this way, let them be fondly cherished, deal gently with them. Parents, when we are functioning in the Lord, when we are functioning in the Lord, we will then have the love of Christ to tenderly and patiently deal with our children this way. In one sense, I was feeling a little bit bad and sad as I prepared this message this past week. Sometimes you feel like a failure when you look back, right? I looked back at my parent and I would say, parenting and I would have to say that I was far too self-absorbed, far too controlling, far too concerned about what people would think about our children and not enough concern to treat them with the love and respect that they deserved. Well, thankfully, thankfully, Children can be quite forgiving, but some scars still remain. But you know, um, there were some good decisions that Audrey and I made as we brought up our children to, and one of them was to try and protect them. We were, you know, I was a pastor, was trying to protect them from the criticism of other church people who felt that they should be better behaved. You know, they're your pastor's children. You should be setting the example. You should be better behaved. Well, they actually were quite hyper. I think they had the same brain issues I did. <laughs> When our children, however, when our children were in their teenage years, the teenage, they were teenagers, we went up to them and said, did you ever feel pressure to be uh, better behaved because you were the pastor's children? Did you ever feel that way? And they said, no, not at all. The thought hadn't even occurred to us. And I say, praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement we received this morning from your word. A difficult subject on parenting. It is so hard. If there's anything that brings out our, our, our inadequacies, Lord, and our shortcomings, it's our children. So, Lord, uh, we just know we love our children, but, oh, we struggle sometimes. And I pray for an anointing upon each uh, parent that's represented in our family, church family, and I pray for those of us, maybe we're not parents anymore or not parents yet. Lord, the, the, this truth, the truth of how to live the Christian life, it's still it's, it's applicable to every one of us. And I pray that it would, been, it would have been a blessing to hear some things today that, that you spoke to our hearts, Lord. So we thank you. We uh, praise you for being so patient. You're the best parent there is, God. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. song together to honor our Father. Father of life, you delight in your children.
have no turning of God that is not used often in the scripture is this phrase, Father of Lights. He said, every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of Lights, in whom there is no change or shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift comes from missed.